At this point, the Grid 600 is iconic. From pictures on Reddit and Instagram to random Frank P building one on his channel, the large forehead filled with a flashy module is instantly recognizable. Its bold design has a great first impression, but what's it like to actually own? The design of the case is unique to say the least. It's got thick bezels throughout and the characteristic giant forehead for the modules. The front profile is an elongated pill shape, while the rear is a rounded rectangle. The side profile blends these two ends into each other, which means a weird looking soft trapezoid. The front and rear edges have a shallow fillet, while the sides are rounded all the way through. This creates a big contrast, which I don't think really works. The bottom has a slightly raised portion, with slots for four large rubber feet, as well as six screws that hold the module in place. Even though the external USB port is through a fixed daughterboard, the cutout isn't 100% tight, and because Type-C ports need to be slightly recessed, you'll see a sliver of cable when plugged in. Even though the Grid 600 is now mostly known paired with the Peaks or Flash module, I think the classic pen rail completes the Model F reproduction look the best. I only have the Peaks module and I think it looks pretty good head-on, but as soon as that rounded wedge side profile comes into view, it just turns kinda ugly. The 10 series GeForce aesthetic just doesn't go with the extra rounded sides. Model F keyboards have rounded front and rear faces. Curiously, the Grid 600 rotates this 90 degrees to place the rounded edges on the sides, which really don't work for these relatively sharp corners. I think this board is one of those that look great at first sight, but looking at it for any longer reveals inconsistencies. The futuristic look of the peaks and flash modules clash too much with a weird bulbous case. I'd really only paired this with the classic or press modules for consistency. Even though this is just a tray mount case, there is a crazy amount of complexity. Starting with the module area, there's actually a good amount of space underneath. This is to support the daughter board connecting the 60% PCB, as well as any additional electronics that your module might use. The daughter board connects out with USB Type-C, and two internal cables are included which provide compatibility with both mini-USB and Type-C PCBs. This does not work with a C2C connection, even if your base PCB supports it. I am so sick of Type-C ports that don't work properly. What's even the point? Moving on to the main cavity, you can see two steps. The inner portion can be filled with the smaller of the two included felt pads, and the larger one can occupy the entire area under the PCB. We'll see if these do anything later. When I first got the board, the felt pads were secured in place by these spacers. The manual says to remove them and doesn't mention them later. Not really sure what these are for, but they'd be really hard to install and I don't think you need them for assembly. Finally, the part that's most personally interesting is the removable center standoff. I've always been a fan of these for the nice bouncy experience they provide when paired with a plateless build. This is a welcome addition, but I do wonder why it was this nice piece of machined aluminum when they probably could have just used a standoff meant for PC motherboards. There was clearly a lot of thought and effort put into bringing this whole package together, which just leaves me with the question, why tray mount? If you're going all this way to develop a module system complete with a daughterboard, why is there such a requirement to use a standard tray mount build? If this had come out a couple years before it did, it'd make more sense, but things like the Xeno and 268.2 happened around the same time. For expensive cases like these, the expectation is for more even mounting mechanisms like top or sandwich. The vibe this board gives off is a talented newcomer designer who isn't too in touch with the meta, but that's where innovations can come from, so nothing wrong with that. I think the engineering that went into this is certainly impressive. Now let's check out the execution. The finish quality on the main case is mostly pretty good. All of the external portions have a fine grain with no scratches or streaks to speak of. The interior is significantly rougher. It looks like this portion wasn't at all processed after machining as it shows all sorts of lines. Also, the tops of the standoffs have some bare aluminum showing through. At first glance, the Peaks module looks okay, and it definitely benefits from that GTX look, but upon closer inspection, you can see lines running the length of the top surface. On its own, this kind of brushed look isn't bad, but it is too noticeable of a difference when compared to the media blasted finish on the case. The bottom also shows a large streak coming from one of the screw holes, which is consistent with what we saw on the case. I get these areas aren't visible, but I still would have liked to see a little more attention to detail here. The included hardware is pretty nice with magnetic screws for the tray mounts, and the felt pads are precisely cut for their slots. I also appreciate these large rubber feet, which feel a little more premium when compared to those tiny bump-ons. Overall, the quality is pretty good. The biggest issue is with the lines on the peaks finish, but that's really not noticeable because of the various shadows it casts on itself. 
To evaluate typing experience, I'll be using my standard platelist build on a plain 60C with stock Gateron yellows. Testing first with the most ordinary setup, which is with the center post with none of the felt pads, it just feels like a tray mount. Solid bottom out on the majority of the board, and when using my platelist build, a little bit of vibration when pressing on S and D with the left hand, and K and L with the right. As you can expect, this flex is wildly inconsistent due to the standoff between the G and H keys. Not pleasant. Next up is the same configuration, but with both foam pieces attached. The smaller piece sits well below the PCB, so I'm not going to do a separate typing field test for that. At installation, you could probably tell what's going to happen. The top of the foam sits flush with the standoffs, which means there's going to be a bit of compression when you screw the PCB in. As expected, the typing feel becomes very stiff, but in a more consistent way. There are no vibrations, so this is not my favorite typing experience. When using these felt pieces, removing the center standoff doesn't really do anything, because the compression is largely what you're feeling here, rather than any effects of these standoffs. So if I'm using the foam, I'd keep the middle piece off, since that just cuts down on the number of screws you gotta undo. Finally, in my favorite configuration, which is with no center posts or felt pads, the typing experience is pleasant. There's a soft bottom out throughout the alphas, with plenty of vibration transfer between the hands. Consistency does take a hit from that post underneath the spacebar, which makes the right side a little stiffer, especially on the zero. But this isn't to such a degree that I actively notice it. If you have a tray case and have been wondering about flexible typing experiences, you should try filing down that middle post and using a platelet build. In my opinion, that's the only tray configuration that's worth using. The sound of this board varies drastically depending on what configuration you use. In the most vanilla one, which is with the center post and no foam, it just kind of sounds like a regular tray mount case, if a bit hollow. This is in contrast to the even hollower sound when you remove the center post. It seems to me that the center post adds a lot of K sound, whereas its absence means more PCB sound. Adding the smaller piece of felt that doesn't make any contact with the PCB results in largely unchanged sound. This is consistent with my past experiences where flat sound dampening material only seems to work when there's some amount of compression. Adding the larger piece of felt gets us this compression. This makes the sound significantly deeper and probably more pleasing to most people. To further drive my previous point about the compression overwhelming any standoff effects, you can hear that there's virtually no difference in sound between center post configurations when compression is involved. This kind of dampening changes the sound, but also the feel, so really, I'd argue that this is an entirely different mounting mechanism. From these experiments, I'll be using it without the center post for that bouncy feel, and leave the small piece of foam in there, just in case the tiny effect it may or may not have is positive. The Grid 600 is a cool concept that was executed adequately. As a buyer, you have a lot of options from choosing your mounting style, sound dampening, as well as these modules. I'm not a big fan of the design on the main case, but with most modules, your attention is going to be focused on the mountains, the lights, or the additional keys. The typing experience in my favorite configuration is really nice, but I know most people are going to use it with the plate, which mostly gets rid of any bounce. 
I'm having a really hard time finding out how much this was at the time of group buy, but I paid $315 from Z Frontier's extra sale. That's a pretty expensive board, and at an aftermarket price of $400, $500, $600, I can't recommend it unless you just gotta have that module's look.